Hello everybody, welcome to the Royal Court and welcome to The Big Idea. This is Angie Hobbs and my name is Claire McQuillan and I'm the curator of The Big Idea. Angie Hobbs is the Professor of Public Understanding and Philosophy at the University of Sheffield, which is the first post of its kind in the UK, and we think the first post of its kind in the world. Angie engages in a, very, in a variety of public and political work in the UK, promoting the role of philosophy in schools, prisons, through adult education, and advises on academic public engagement. She contributes to radio and TV programs, and now theatre, and um, she gives lectures and talks around the world on public engagement philosophy. Angie has given us her card, so the ushers will be giving out her cards on the way out, so you can tweet her or email her to carry on the conversation after the lecture. So Angie will give her talk, and then there will be uh, sort of five minutes for Q&A at the end, there will then be a brief moment where we research the stage and then we will go straight into Chris Thorpe's play, You're Not As Tall As You Look. There's no interval, so please do stay in your seats in between the talk and the play. Thank you, and I'll leave it time to you. Okay, thank you so much, Claire. It's wonderful to be here. My second time in two days, because I saw Birdland last night, and if you've not seen it yet, you're, you're in for a treat. It was a really terrific theatrical experience and uh, very moving, very powerful, also very entertaining. I wasn't expecting just how witty it was going to be. It was terrific fun in a grim kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I've been asked to talk about the philosophy behind fame and celebrity and status and uh, some of the, all the ideas that are being uh, explored in Birdland so vividly. And I'm going to do it mainly, though not entirely, through the uh, lens of Plato, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher, writing uh, in the fifth, sorry, well, born in the fifth century BC, mainly writing in the fourth century BC in Athens, because what he has to say is just still so important. Now, uh, sometimes to read the media, you think we've just invented. Uh, a cult of celebrity and fame. Of course that's not true. Humans have always, uh, or some humans have always desired fame. Uh, in uh, Homer's Iliad, uh, written maybe about 750 BC, or brought finally together about 750 BC, the character of Achilles, top guy in book 18, when he finally comes out of his mega sulk and emerges from his tent to re-engage with the fighting, uh, he says that he wants to avenge the death of his beloved Patroclus. And also, he says, and to win excellent glory. He wants to win glory. He's quite explicit and conscious about that. And the ancients were well aware that one of the many motivations people have for seeking fame and glory is as a compensation for death. Uh, they're very explicit about that. The, the underworld, Hades, does not get a particularly good press in uh, Homer and elsewhere. It's uh, not a, a great place, and they're looking for ways for their name to live on in this world after their bodily life, at least, has ended. So in that same uh, passage in Book 18 of the Iliad, Achilles, um, just before he says that he's going to go back to battle to win excellent glory, he says, I know that if I go back to battle, now I'm going to die soon. My uh, mother, the sea goddess Thetis, has told me that I have a choice uh, between I can either live a long and nondescript life back home in Greece in Thea, managing his lands there, or he can uh, have a glorious life but die young. He has to choose, and he chooses death and glory. And of course you've got the, the irony, which is not lost on later philosophers like uh, Cicero and Lucretius in Rome, that people can be so kind of fearful of death or loathing of death and so desiring of fame as a compensation for death that they will seek an early death in order to get the fame that will live on after them. And so that irony, as I said, is pointed out by a number of philosophers. So it's not a new phenomenon. However, there are, I think, two main differences uh, between how this desire manifested itself uh, in the ancient world and how it manifests itself today. 
Uh, I should have checked whether you can all hear me. Can you all? Yes. You can. Good, good, yes, right. I'm used to trying to wake up uh, hungover 19-year-olds at, <laughs> at, at 10 in the morning, which actually only wouldn't be up for 10 in the morning. 12 in the morning, they've just tottered out of bed. So I'm used to throwing my voice out to wake them up. Okay, two main differences between how this desire for fame manifested itself in the ancient world and how it articulates, uh, is articulated today. First difference, um, there was, of course, no vast media machine in the ancient world. Really, unless you were a king or an emperor and had your head on a coin, nobody would know what you looked like, uh, and nobody would have heard of you except by word of mouth, unless you did things so glorious uh, that some poet decided to write about you. You got some Homer. There may possibly have been some historic counterparts to Achilles and Agamemnon and so on. So it had to be word of mouth. What does that mean? It, why would people talk about you from village to village so the, the word got passed on? You would have to have done something or achieved something or created something notable. Uh, so the current divorce, you would have to have done something worth talking about for good or bad. So the current divorce between being a celebrity and doing something worth celebrating just wasn't possible. <laughs> I mean, it is extraordinary, isn't it, uh, how, how many celebrities are, are yeah. worth celebrating? Some, of course, are. Uh, anyway. Now, I've said you had to do something notable for good or bad. That's true, but what's interesting, this is the second point of difference, is how people on the whole really wanted to be famous and to win honor and acclaim for doing something of benefit or perceived to be a benefit to their society. They wanted to be famous for being good at something. They wanted to be famous for moral or intellectual or physical excellence. Uh, some of you will know uh, the ancient Greek word arete, uh, just all round excellence. It's usually translated virtue, but it's got a much broader meaning than that. Now, there were exceptions. The guy who ma mainly destroyed the Temple of Artemis in, at Ephesus, one of the wonders of the ancient world, said at his trial, I did it so my name shall live on forevermore. I refuse to say his name because he did such a terrible thing. He destroyed one of the wonders of the ancient world. You can go and look it up on Wikipedia. I'm not going to give you his name. He's deprived us of the temple of Artemis. And again, back to uh, Homer's uh, Iliad. Uh, earlier on in the Iliad, Achilles says, I want to be the best of the Achaeans, the best. And he wants also to be regarded as being the best and honoured for being the best. And that's why he's so fed up with Agamemnon, who's taken his prize woman, because he thinks this has dishonoured him. So that's the uh, setup that Plato inherited. Plato born possibly, we, we, nobody's actually really sure the date is where, possibly about 427 BC. What, what Plato does with this ethos is extraordinary, and I think, I really genuinely think it's one of the key uh, moments in the history of Western ethics and psychology. So first of all, Plato divides the human psyche into three aspects. He calls them parts, but they're not geographical parts. They're, there's no topography. They're three different motivational sets. Firstly, there's the rational part. And this desires, because his re in Plato, reason is a desiring thing. It's not arid, it's not emotionless, it has desires. It desires truth and reality. Particularly knowledge of the human good. Secondly, and this is key for our talk today, and key, I think, for a, a lens through which to look at Birdland, there is a spirited element. Uh, in the Greek, it's called the thumos or the thumo aides. And this spirited element desires success and victory and honor and glory and respect. 
It's the bit of us which needs to feel we count for something, that we matter, that our lives matter. And part of feeling that you count for something, part of your own self-respect, uh, was felt to be the respect of others. So if others respected you, that helped feed your own self-respect. And that is really crucial. And then the third aspect is the appetitive part, which desires food, drink, sex, material possessions, and the money, which Plato says is needed to acquire them. Quite why Plato thinks we need money to acquire sex, we will let pass. <laughs> So it's not just reason and the appetites. For some of you who've done philosophy at school or university, you'll remember this, you know, the big divide between reason and emotion, reason and the appetites in Luther, in Hume, in Kant, and so on. This is different, even in Christianity and in some of the world religions. This is different. There's a third aspect, the bit which really desires honor and respect, the feeling that we matter. Sort of similar to the French, amour propre, in a way. And really this aspect was rather ignored by Western uh, philosophers until we get to Bishop Butler in the 18th century. But interestingly, it's been hugely taken up, consciously taken up, knowing its platonic origins by Freud. Uh, Freud's uh, superego, his ego, superego in the end. Freud acknowledges his uh, indebtedness to Plato and says that in some ways his superego is related to Plato's thumos. And then also the... Uh, Psychologist, psych uh, psychiatrist Adler uh, also, uh, this is actually his key, his key motivation for humans. So there has been a big resurgence of interest in Plato's psychology in the beginning, at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, it's hugely important that for Plato, this thumaedic aspect, the spirited aspect that desires honour and success and glory and fame and all the rest of it, is an intrinsic part of who we are. We, we can't get rid of it. We have to work with it. And Plato says the good news is we can harness this. We can channel it for good. We can channel the desire for honour, the ambition for honour for good, providing uh, we allow reason to rule our psyches overall and we allow reason to come up with an overall conception of the good life, and we fit our ambitions for honour and success uh, into that overall conception of a rational good. If we do that, then, says Plato, in a wonderful image in his dialogue, the Phaedrus, uh, which is, as you will find out if you're about to see Birdland, is actually very evocative of Birdland. If we can do that, harness our human appetites for honour into the right framework, then we will start to grow wings, says Plato. We will start to grow wings. We will get to be able to fly. There's a wonderful image of a flying philosopher in the Phaedrus, which I urge you to read if you've never had that treat. Now, however, says Plato, this is not an easy task. And Plato is very clear that this spirited thumoidic element, the honour-loving element, um, is our most social aspect. Why? Well, of course, think of what it wants. It wants honour and respect. Those can only be given to you by other people. You are dependent on other people's view of you to get what this bit of your psyche needs. So the individual is very enmeshed in his or her society and his or her society's values to achieve the honour that it craves. And how do you win honour and acclaim? By doing or being or creating the things that your society already honours and acclaims. So Plato realises that in a way this spirited element of you is actually a conservative element. It's, it's going to reproduce the role models and the role actions are available in your society. However, Plato also sees that you can use that also to reform and refashion society. So this intrinsically conservative element can play its part in a social revolution. Because Plato says if we can model society again, if we can reform society, if we can 
develop different goals, different role models, different uh, objectives, uh, different things to honour, then we can harness this conservative uh, aspect of the thumos to anchor and to develop this reformed, refashioned, radicalised society. So this conservative element can be used, put to revolutionary use. And this, of course, is exactly what Plato does in his in probably the most famous political work ever written along with Das Kapital uh, in the Republic, in which he says, if you're going to reform the individual, you're going to have to reform society because some of the individual's goals depend on a claim from society and are profoundly socially enmeshed. You can't reform individuals piecemeal. There has to be a social revolution. Now, things go very badly wrong. So we've seen things go pretty badly wrong for Plato if the Thumos desires to get honour through things that reason has not endorsed, has not endorsed as part of the good life. Things go really badly wrong, says Plato, if the goals of the spirited, ambitious, honour-loving element, the thumos, fuse with the goals of your appetitive, materialistic element. It's, a, it's bad enough to just put too much emphasis in your life on wanting material possessions, says Plato. That's dangerous enough. It's going to distract you too much from your philosophic search for the good. But if you then confuse material goods with the source of honour, if you think that the way, not just to satisfy your appetites, but the way to satisfy your honour-loving element is through the acquisition, consumption and display of material goods, then you are really, really in trouble. And don't forget, under material goods, he includes the non-loving use of other people's bodies uh, and so on. Again, all in ways that are very relevant and resonant in Birdland. So you're really in trouble. That's when things have just gone horribly wrong. And reason just then becomes a means end uh, faculty. Instead of reason providing the goals, the thumos and the appetites, just tell reason what the goals are and say, reason, you go and work out how we get there. Reason doesn't have a say in shaping your life reason is just told how to provide uh, the means to the end. So rather than telling us, for instance, what we can do with money and how money fits into the good life, reason is just told how to provide economic growth, to take just one modern example, at random, of course. <laughs> OK, now, what would happen? So where are we? Oh, so we started at five past, I think I've got ten more minutes. Okay, what would Plato say if we uh, resurrected him, if he does believe in a life after death, if we resurrected him and put him in contemporary Britain? What happens if you apply his tripartite psychology to current circumstances, particularly in Britain, but I think more generally in the West? I think we can draw three main conclusions. Firstly, by failing to locate our need for recognition and honour, which we are stuck with, we have to accept this is part of human nature. By failing to locate this need for honour within an overall conception of the rational good life, we are depriving ourselves of the chance to live the most flourishing human lives that we can, we are depriving ourselves of the chance to be the best people that we can. By wanting fame for fame's sake, we are not even going to achieve substitute immortality, which we saw is one of the, the motivations behind a desire for fame, a desire to compensate for death. Because imagine, in 200 years' time, Somebody's wandering in a graveyard and looking at the inscriptions on the tombstones, and they see, I don't know, somebody on a reality TV show, which I won't name, they just see X, Y, they see their dates, and they just say, X, Y was famous. That is the inscription. X was famous. Somebody in 200 years' time is going to look at that and go, what? 
What for what? You know, not to me, not famous to me. And they will walk on out of the graveyard and that person won't be famous. You can't just write X was famous on a tombstone. It means nothing. So we won't even achieve that. And because, as we've seen, Plato thinks we're in the deepest possible trouble if we conflate the objects of desire of our spirited, honour-loving element and our appetitive, materialistic element. And given we're clearly in that trouble, uh, think what this might mean for two recent uh, causes of concern, let's, should we put it like that, that we've had in British society. And I think applying platonic psychology can both help us analyse these two problematic uh, episodes in our recent history uh, and also provide, I think, at least part of a solution. So there's a good news story here. So first of all, all the fuss over pay and bonuses. Um, you know, a time and time again, and I'm not trying to offend any bankers in the audience. I, as the saying goes, many of my best friends are bankers, and that actually is true. So I'm not trying to knock bankers or banking, but of course there's, and it's not just bankers pay that is in the news, but of course that's one profession. There's pay in general, bonuses in general. Well, Plato might say, well look, well let's think this through. What does the banker or whoever it is, what do they really want here? Do they just want more money? Now in some cases that might be true, but in many cases I think what the banker or whoever it is whatever profession you're dealing with wants, is to feel that they are respected, that they are honoured, that their life is a success. People need to feel that their life and their work is successful. If we currently live in a culture where the symbol of being successful is a bonus of three times your current salary, if you think this is, <coughs> comes out of sort of jealousy of the because philosophers are always paid very badly. You know, there may be some unconscious uh, jealousy here. <laughs> if that's your symbol to yourself of success, well, of course you're going to want a big bonus, because, you know, X and Y in the office down the corridor have got an even bigger bonus, and your work's as good as theirs. If that's the way you are measuring success, if that's the way you measure how good you are at banking, but of course, you know, pay and bonuses in themselves do not give us any sign of who is good or not good at banking. They give us a sign of who is good or not good at getting money out of banking for themselves, and that's a different question. It wasn't always like this. We're always told, you know, we have to keep all these the bonuses up or people will leave. Well, okay, maybe. It wasn't always like this. This is a relatively new phenomenon. If you go back to the 18th and particularly the 19th century and examine the history of the great Quaker banking families, which, yes, did amass a lot of money, but then gave it away and built communities in Sheffield, where I now work, in Bourneville, uh, you know, near Birmingham and so on. The idea was that you used your money to, to give back, and the sign of your success was not, not how much money you left in your will, or how much money you had in your bank at the end of the year, but what you had done with your money, how good a banker you had been, what kind of service to the community you had given. So there were different criteria for being successful in banking. Now that's not going to get rid of greed in banking or any other profession, but it will reduce it because the sheer accumulation of material wealth is at the very most only one of the motivations going on in people who feel they deserve a bigger pay rise or bigger increment. So that helps us analyse the problem, but it also provides part of the solution. We need to look really carefully at the way people are rewarded and what they're rewarded Second, and, and secondly, the, I think I've got six minutes, secondly, the riots, the England riots. At the time, if you may remember, uh, there was some, and I, I don't say this to make a huge, big party political point, but there were some very disappointing comments in the press. I think they were made by Kenneth Clark. I hope for better, he likes jazz, but there we go. <laughs> One, he called the rioters shameless, and two, he called them a feral underclass. 
Now, if we use Plato's psychology, we can see that in both respects, those comments are inaccurate and lazy and indeed dangerous. Very, very few people, Plato would say, are shameless in the sense of being without a sense of shame and honour. He said, it, you know, it's almost intrinsic to every human being. The problem wasn't that the rioters had no sense of shame and honour, but they located shame and honour in places where most of us would wish they did not locate them, i.e. in the uh, acquisition and display of sort of shiny white goods and trainers and so on, because it wasn't food shops that were looted, nor was it a big political riot. Uh, magistrates' courts weren't attacked, police stations weren't attacked. It was about uh, the acquisition and display of certain goods which were felt to bestow honour and prestige and be a sign of success. Um, I don't know if this is a true story, I hope it is, I was following it all on Twitter, and um, a guy who claimed to be working in a bookshop in one of the areas, the, the rioting areas, uh, said, you know, we're keeping our bookshop open. These rioters could use a few looted books. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, he tweeted sadly, stayed open all evening, not a single book stolen. <laughs> Now that might be apocryphal. I, I, cho I choose to believe it. It's a great story, but it, it makes the point. Now, why were they doing this? Well, Plato might say they were correct in thinking that in current Britain they would get more respect and honour if they did consume and display certain kinds of goods. Because Plato would also uncomfortably point out to us that in their motivational set, they were no different from, I don't know, bankers short-selling. They were no different from politicians fiddling expenses. Yes, maybe in some cases different socio-economic groups. Yes, maybe different uh, kinds of education in their background. In some cases, not all. Uh, yes, maybe different kinds of material goods uh, were being desired. But the motivational set would be no different. So Plato, if he was looking at this, would say, stop calling these people an underclass, because underclass suggests something completely separate and different from the rest of society. And these people are simply going after the goals that society in Britain um, as a whole is endorsing at the moment. So stop thinking the riots have nothing to do with what middle and upper class people are doing in Britain. It's part of the same package, it's just different ways of exhibiting it, different ways of displaying it. So Plato would absolutely point that out. Get rid, they were not shameless, it was a different sense of shame and honour, dislocated he would say and perverted he would say, but not shameless and not an underclass. And I'm sure I don't need to point out to a court uh, audience at the Royal Court how calling any set of humans feral uh, after the 1930s is completely disgraceful and should not be accepted. So those are two ways in looking at pay and rewards and in looking at analysing the riots that Plato's psychology can be put to very helpful use and can in some ways provide us with a way out. By looking, by saying let's look again at how we measure and rate success then you're going to get less bad behaviour. I end on a note of hope, however. We started off by saying the ancient Greeks didn't have the celebrity machine to go and uh, get their name out there on Twitter and Facebook and or, you know, blogs and so on. Let's, if you consider the Latin root of the word fame, because it actually comes from the, a Latin word, farmer, which means to be the subject of report, to be the subject of gossip or discussion. If everybody has all these sites, and I'm as guilty as anybody, I have a Twitter site, uh, and everybody's putting their name out there, you will get to a situation where you're putting your name out there, but nobody is reading your Twitter feed, and nobody is talking about you. So, you get to a point of a media explosion where actually the explosion becomes an implosion and you get to the point where the machine starts to destroy itself. Hurrah, you might think. Because there are so many different ways of getting your name out there that everybody has their name out there but nobody is thinking about you or talking about you. 
And this is going to be a great thing, because it's going to mean that to actually get honour and respect and glory, you're going to have to go back to where we were in ancient Greece, and people are going to actually have to do, achieve, create something of benefit to their society in order to win a claim. Thank you.
you know, so okay, rah, that, that's, that's how you do Glastonbury, wow. And I thought, you know, the, 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 their collective age was goodness knows what. Now they of course, they of course trained, they learned their profession before all this really took off. Yes, there were newspapers and there was TV, but they, they learned like the Beatles and so on, they learned in clubs, they learned playing to small audiences, they learned their craft. They learned how to sing and dance and play instruments and write lyrics. And I'm encouraged that the bands that last longest still tend to be the one, Leonard, you know, or Leonard Cohen, or did, uh, people who actually have got talent. Have you got Commander Donald, which is a bit disheartening with kind of uh, bandwagon. Uh, is she still famous? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I haven't heard a record of hers for years, but maybe that's because I've listened to, to Radio 3. <laughs> She's not on Radio 3 too yeah. much yet. <laughs> Okay, so, so, no, I, I feel quite optimistic. I really do think that media only prolong your life by 10, 20, 30 years at most. The stuff that's going to live on. Because um, anyway, because it's also these people are managing the manipulation of the media to promote Absolutely. their names. And when they're yes. no longer around to do that, it will be the worth of the, yeah. the, the you know, and I'm not aware, I mean, you know, good pops to those she is or was. I mean, she's not written lyrics that are going to match uh, Cohen or Dylan or, you know, you know, it's, it, she's not going to, her voice is not going to be um, in, in the ilk of I, I Nina Simone or, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the people who will live on, on the whole, are the good people. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of dross written in antiquity as well, you know, I mean, it just sort of got sifted out. Uh, and it's very, very interesting, you, you read people like Aristotle, who was a have read so much more of it than we have available to us. What play did he say would live on forever and ever? Sophocles is Oedipus Rex, Oedipus Tyrannus. It has. I saw a production recently, it blew me away. I was in total tears. Euripides, Women of Trachis. You know, the, the, they knew these were the best plays and they've been right. On the whole, humans, I think, are quite trust, I think humans do spot genuine, genuine worth. Uh, it's interesting. We got to, we got to go. Oh, we got to go the second. We got to go the second. I'm so sorry. Get my card on the way out and tweet me or email me. Thank you so much for being here. to introduce you to Ryan. Ryan will be playing Rob Cooper this afternoon. There is a real person called Rob Cooper and we did ask him if he'd like to come and sit here for 10 minutes or so while this happened, but Rob was busy or didn't want to. <laughs> I'm Nikki and I'm performing a script written by Chris. None of these words are mine. Chris isn't here. In a total abdication of responsibility for what happens here this evening, he's in Germany. He wasn't even in rehearsal. Chris hasn't written any words for Rob Cooper. Ryan works in the theater, in the box office, and he's agreed to be Rob Cooper. Ryan won't be impersonating Rob Cooper, nor will he be asked to imagine what Rob might say in any given circumstance. He's just here to fill a Rob-shaped hole on stage. <laughs> He's not been asked to be here because he resembles Rob Cooper in any way. Any resemblance to the actual Rob Cooper, or even an actual Rob Cooper, is purely coincidental. As I said, we did ask Rob Cooper to be here and Ryan will be reading out the underwhelming email exchange with Rob towards the end of the piece. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Cooper works, works at a company called Celebrity Culture Limited. The website address is celebrityculture, or one word, lowercase, .co.uk. Rob Cooper is a talent manager. The physical address of Celebrity Culture Limited is 86 to 90 Paul Street, Shoreditch, London EC 2A 4NE. 
Rob's Twitter handle is at Rob Cooper online. What Rob's company does is it manages the profiles of celebrities. I'm not going to quote extensively from the Celebrity Culture Limited website, but I think it would be helpful right now to read the section called About Us, above which on the website is a black and white banner picture of a tiger on a red carpet with a rank of photographers behind it. <laughs> Celebrity Culture Limited is a London-based entertainment company specialising in media personalities, reality stars and sporting heroes. Unlike many other companies, we embrace the new age of celebrity and work closely with the national media to raise clients' profiles and maximise earning potential. The Celebrity Culture Limited team are not only experienced in working with known celebrities, we also work closely with many nightclubs, promoters, photographers and small businesses to raise awareness on new products, services or campaigns, forming working relationships amongst one another. There are then various subsections, celebrity bookings, press and publicity, talent management and event management, respective photographs, all black and white, chimpanzee in Eric Morgan glasses on telephone, Squirrel, reading newspaper, guinea pig in shades, and kitten in cardigan. All very well done. Word of advice. Under talent management, it says, over recent months, we have been inundated with requests of representation. We are currently only considering representation requests for reality TV stars and glamour models. Anyway, this is all just context. Rob Cooper manages, or used to manage, as Chris is writing these words on the 22nd of April, and it is now the 10th of May, a 23-year-old woman from Leeds called Josie Cunningham. Chris had never heard of Josie Cunningham until the 20th of April, Easter Sunday. Josie Cunningham first came to prominence about a year ago when it was revealed she'd been given breast implants on the NHS, funded by the UK taxpayer. This caused a lot of debate and opinion and ended up being reported in all the papers. It was front page news. Josie Cunningham was given breast implants to help her with the psychological and emotional difficulties caused by having insufficient breast tissue. This seems like a good reason to be given breast implants. However, Josie also wants to be a glamour model. She is named Katie Price as her heroine and wants to emulate her. She is using the breasts given to her by the NHS to further this ambition. There are obviously several ways to look at this. It's fair to assume the NHS didn't just give Josie Cunningham breast enhancements because she asked for them. That's not the way it works. There must have been an assessment and a genuine chance of psychological benefit and Josie says she's happier. If Josie then wants to use her breasts and her newfound happiness to make a career for herself, ably represented by Rob Cooper, then that's fine, isn't it? It's kind of a vindication of the decision to give her the surgery. It's definitely enhanced her life and she's making the most of it. It's not like she's a liver transplant patient who's gone straight down the pub as soon as she soon as she left the hospital. <coughs> to be fair, Josie doesn't help matters by making her Twitter photo a topless shot of herself with tape printed with the NHS logo across her nipples. <laughs> <laughs> or by repeatedly responding to online criticism by thanking the critics for their tax contributions towards her press. <coughs> I don't know whether Josie's been told to do this or come up with it on her own, and it doesn't matter because even if it was someone else's idea, she's going along with it, and from her interview, she seems to know what she's doing and have a flair for the deliberately controversial. She's not an idiot. Anyway, on the 20th of April, Easter Sunday, the Sunday Mirror published a story <coughs> online and in the paper that quoted Josie Cunningham, who is by now 18 weeks pregnant, as saying she was considering an abortion because there was a chance of her being invited to participate in Celebrity Big Brother 
and she wouldn't be allowed to do it if she was pregnant and felt it was too good a career opportunity to pass up. In the online version of the story, there was a video interview with Josie in which she clearly said this. The fact that women and men and women routinely think about abortion as an option for career related reasons was kind of lost in the reaction that followed. But I guess being on Celebrity Big Brother isn't judged as a valid career aspiration by most people, even though for Josie Cunningham, it totally is. I guess you can infer from the fact Rob Cooper is publicly identified as Josie Cunningham's manager that he was at least aware the interview was going on. You might even infer that they discussed the content of the interview together, that it was a strategy. Doesn't matter either. Kind of sensible, really, if you want to stay in the public eye and maximise your earning potential. If Rob wasn't aware the interview was going on or of what Josie Cunningham was going to say, I guess you could conclude he dropped the ball in a way that makes him shit at his job. <laughs> but again, not really relevant. I don't think Rob is shit at his job, by the way. The tweets projected here are all reactions taken from a single half hour period on Easter Sunday. I haven't edited out the supported tweets. There weren't any. Rob doesn't have to justify these tweets. He didn't write them, although it's possible to imagine him being pleased they exist. It's unlikely by the time this is performed, there's any chance of Josie Cunningham being on Big Brother pregnant or not. I don't know if she's still represented by Rob, although considering how visible she's been, I'm going to guess she still is. It's unlikely Josie Cunningham will actually have an abortion to go on Big Brother, but she said that she's thinking of it. And that's the main thing. I was going to write a monologue about fame, but I thought it would be better to put a bit of fame in the room and see if anyone had any questions. This isn't about calling anyone to account. This isn't going to change anything. Please adjust some things in this room. This is the way things are. This is just a reaction. It's the longer version of one of these tweets, like the newspaper columns that have doubtless been written between me writing this and you hearing it. I'm not immune. I'm not saying I'm clever. This isn't standing above looking down. This is just part of the game. Doesn't matter. None of it matters really, does it? Let's just sit here, read these, and run the clock out. While we do that, Ryan is going to read Rob Cooper's responses to the two emails Claire McQuillan, who is the curator of The Big Idea, sent to him. The first response is declining the invitation to be here. The second is in response to Claire asking him why he didn't want to be here. Neither of them are very long, but you'll notice in the first one, Rob asks if the show will be viewable online. It is. We are live streaming and it will be online until the 31st of May. If anyone wants to ask Rob a question while we're watching the projection, feel free. The mics are probably good enough to pick it up. Alternatively, we'll leave the camera running at the end if you'd rather, rather ask him something more privately. <coughs> he probably won't get back to any of us, but he did ask. And I suppose there's even a small chance, since this is being live streamed, that he is watching us right now. Also, be polite. You will notice from the emails that Rob is nothing but enthusiastic and polite. None of this is Rob Cooper's fault. Hi Claire, apologies for the late reply. Unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to commit to being involved in something like this at the moment. However, I would love to see it. Will it be uploaded online anywhere? All the best with it, Rob. <laughs> Hi Rob. Also, I wanted to ask, are you unable to take part at the moment because the story with Josie is ongoing, or for another reason? I hope you don't mind me asking, I was just interested to know. Many thanks. 
Claire. Aye, Claire. It's just not my kind of thing, I'm afraid. Josie's story, forward slash life, will continue to have many twists and turns, and the media will continue covering it to at least the end of the year, at the very minimum. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah. Kiss. <laughs>